We have been very productive in the past during the pandemic and managed almost one webinar per week for nearly 60 weeks. And we needed a well-deserved break. And after having had the summer off, we are back again. And uh, we hope that you and your loved ones are safe and healthy. My name is Chai Mudgal. And our new series is being offered on the first and third Thursdays of each month all the way through March 2022. It is called the AO North America Masterclass. In each session, a master of a certain topic will cover every possible aspect of a condition or injury or surgery, along with technical pearls and pitfalls and cutting edge evidence. If you look for synonyms for the word master in the thesaurus, words that come across an expert, genius, maestro, or virtuoso. Our inaugural master fulfills all those criteria. It gives me great joy and it's an honor and privilege to introduce my old friend, colleague and mentor for over 30 years, Jesse Jupiter. He's going to talk to us about distal radius malunions. And Kevin Malone from Cleveland is going to be fielding your questions. Finally, in association with uh, Steve Schwartz, Chitra Subramaniam, our CLO, and the entire EO North America Hand Education Committee, we are excited to announce our pilot co-streaming and collaboration with Ortho TV Global, a platform dedicated to orthopedic education across the world. We hope that with this collaboration, we would be in a position to increase our uh, footprint and influence and uh, enhance our educational abilities for learners and disseminate knowledge and experience to more learners across the world. This will not only uh, emphasize our abilities, but also cement our leadership role in the world of hand surgery education across the world. Prior to this, all the uh, disclosures have been resolved. This is a content validation statement that is required, and I will leave it there for a few seconds for you to peruse. Dr. Jupiter will be talking about distal radius malleon when and how to correct for about 45 to 50 minutes, after which we will have a case discussion. And Kevin Malone will be fielding your questions. All your microphones have been muted and your videos have been turned off. But we certainly want to hear from you because this is all about dialogue. And please send your questions through the Q&A. The chat is a function only for the faculty, so please use the Q&A. Finally, you have to understand that a, an, a collaboration and a uh, endeavor of this nature does not come just by me doing it or by Dr. Jupiter doing it, it requires a team. And we have a fantastic team. Steve Schwartz, Chitra Subramaniam, sure. Jennifer Singerup, who's our new education manager and who we welcome because this is her first event after saying bye-bye to uh, Doreen Winters, who's gone on to other things in the same organization. Ron Costello and Abigail, who are uh, in charge of the uh, digital learning along with Candice McCoy. And finally, not uh, last and least, uh, Max Sandusky, who is going to be our technical host for this evening. Our learner objectives are for the whole series, and I will not belabor the point by reading each and every segment of it, but I want you to spend a couple minutes or a couple seconds just going through this. These will apply to the entire series through March 2022. With that being said, Max, I will stop my sharing now and hand it over to you. Dr. Jupiter, all yours. Okay, just a second. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for allowing me to participate. Uh, uh, and I extend my appreciation to Dr. Mudgall and his team uh, of having participated in the program over the last winter. It's a remarkable advance in uh, 
distant learning education and really has put AO North America and hand uh, AO uh, hand on the map. And so I think um, I congratulate you and, and on your continuation of this. Well, why, why talk about this? It, really, it's the most common problem. Fortunately, uh, function doesn't necessarily follow form in, in distal radius uh, trauma. As we see patients who will function very well with some degree of deformity. But the fact is that it can be associated with not only uh, limited uh, function, but also radiocarpal problems and distal radioulnar problems. Uh, let's go back. I think for a surgeon, uh, this is uh, something that if you embark on trying to correct it, you really need a clear understanding of the deformity and the various aspects of the surgical approach to try to improve the situation. From here, I would look at the learning out outcomes is to try to understand the pathomechanics of deformity, look at some of the indications for uh, intervention, some of the surgical considerations specific to the deformity, mention about bone graft problems and look at intraarticular problems as well. Now these two references are dated, as you see, but I think they identify the fact that myself and my colleague Diego Fernandez in Switzerland have been interested in this problem for many years. And um, They've culminated in not only a lot of publications and presentations, but even a textbook. Um, and just as an aside, when I asked my chairman, Henry Mankin, to write a forward for the textbook, um, Fractures of Distal Radius, he started out by saying, I can't believe you have a whole book on this subject. I thought it was a solved problem but it's become clear that it's not quite th that simple. Again, I will reiterate the fact that function doesn't necessarily follow form. As we see many patients with extraordinary deformities uh, function well. And some of the more recent prospective randomized studies coming out of Austria and elsewhere, randomizing in older age patients, volar plate fixation versus uh, cast and immobilization, uh, one of the outcomes is that the anatomy was better, obviously, from surgical intervention, but the function ultimately was better in the non-operative group. And this is what has been seen in uh, large studies in UK. Uh, so keep that in mind and to put things in perspective. Deformities can be intra or extra or combined in terms of the articular surface. But we see uh, a, still a fair number of people who have had a, uh, an unstable distal radius fracture reduced. And just to watch it, as you look at the sequence of these x-rays, uh, progress to the original deformity uh, that they had when they presented. And so the understanding of fracture instability still remains whether or not we treat these operatively or non-operatively. We look at things from, in the past, two-dimensional x-rays and look at the sagittal projection and the frontal projection. Uh, but in reality, um, deformity is a combination of projections and it's a really a multi-planar deformity with a vector, the vector is only in one plane. So any of you who have ever experienced working with Ilizarov techniques, that's one thing you learn quickly, that what you really need to understand is the true vector of deformity. And so rotational malalignment is sometimes hard to judge from a two-dimensional uh, X-ray projection. But what happens when we have a deformity such as illustrated here, we'll often see a, 
the effect is on the radiocarpal joint, uh, we'll see cartilage overload on the end of the radius, and that may produce pain. And sometimes patients will, their major uh, presentation is pain, uh, and the pain is from cartilage overload, per se, just like we see in the uh, femoral head and the acetabular loading. So a patient like this will have excellent extension, but lack uh, palmar flexion because of the change in the radiocarpal alignment illustrated by the arrow. Several biomechanical studies have shown as you increase the dorsal extension of the end of the radius, you begin to change the force loading on the radius and it moves over more toward the ulnar side uh, and the dorsal aspect of the radiocarpal joint. And that's why these patients not only have motion loss, but may have pain. Interestingly, that some of these have an uh, adaptive dizzy deformity. That is to say, there. if you look at this sagittal projection, the x-ray of the distal radius malposition is about 35 degrees. And look at the capitolunate axis, it's the same. So if you correct this deformity of the radius, it should correct the carpal malalignment. And we call that a reducible or lax deformity. However, if that's been associated, the injury with some intercarpal problem, such as a ligament a tear or some other reason, that may be fixed, that deformity. And correction of the malunion may not improve the, the uh, alignment and may not uh, allow the patient to regain palmar flexion. So here's a patient who had an adaptive or mobile uh, carpal deformity. And here in the correction of the malunion, the deformity is corrected uh, back to a uh, relatively normal position. Whereas this patient had a um, malposition, an osteotomy, but never changed the a carpal malalignment. And that becomes a problem if the patient still is having pain or lack of motion. So the goals, therefore, are to reorient the articular surface for normal load transmission. Really, the end of the radius is supporting the carpus and supporting the hand. And by re restoring the normal mal um, um, alignment, we're restoring not only the carpal alignment, but the uh, carpal, uh, radiocarpal ligaments that hold things together. Therefore, the carpal kinematics will improve. Likewise, the distal radial ulna joint, what we saw frequently with malunions is an alteration of the ulnar head to the sigmoid notch and an alteration in distal radial ulna joint fusion uh, function. But what are the indications? Well, clearly functional limitation with deformity, pain, as I, I wanna highlight that because patients can present with pain and the pain may, may uh, or not be clear, but it may be due to carpal uh, malalignment and car, uh, uh, the cartilage overload in the end of the radius. Instability, distal radial in the joint problems, and articular incongruity will address in a little while is obviously a problem uh, that uh, may need to be dealt with. However, when the patient presents down the line with some problems with articular advanced cartilage changes or fixed carpal instability, extensive osteoporosis or decreased functional capabilities is probably not a good indication. What might be a, really an absolute indication is a patient who's experienced a complex regional pain uh, problem and it presents with a very stiff hand uh, and joint contractures. That patient needs to be mobilized and get a more compliant soft tissue envelope. So that's probably at that point, not a good idea of intervening. The question comes up is about timing. Uh, traditionally, we would like the fracture to heal 
identify the malposition, have the patient get a sufficient therapy and go down the line and then see if that presents a long-term problem. But at the same token, when faced with a real clear deformity in a fracture that's slipped or not well reduced uh, in an active patient, uh, the question comes up is, is it important to wait and see, or maybe the patient is benefited by uh, early intervention? So I, I had seen some patients with clear deformities at a month or six weeks, and I said to myself, uh, why wait? Um, it's, that patient is not going to do well, and why not uh, intervene sooner? Recognizing that the bone may, may have some disuse osteopenia and uh, may may not be more difficult. And having done a few of these, and then I started to do more, I actually wanted to look at these. So I, I looked at about 10 cases done early and 10 cases done uh, at a more traditional uh, time. And what I found was it really does facilitate correction, not only of the radius deformity, but bringing back the distal radial ulnar joint alignment. And frequently, there's no need for structural graft. It certainly shortens the duration of rehabilitation and limiting the overall disability. So if you see this, um, uh, it may be a good indication. And certainly there's enough support in the literature to uh, um, support doing this. So let's look at surgical technique. Uh, we've looked at these fractures from a dorsal displacement, a volar displacement, uh, and in the past, based primarily on measurements of the um, deformity and compared to the opposite side. So as outlined in these uh, cartoons and drawn out on the patient's, patient's hand, looking at from a, a dorsal deformity, what we see is shortening we see extension of the end of the radius. We may or may not see carpal malalignment. And what we don't always appreciate is there's often a rotational deformity of the end of the radius. And one of the difficulties of approaching it dorsally, albeit it seems like that's where the deformity is, is judging the rotational malposition. Now, I mentioned about bone graft, and how can you tell before surgery, whether or not you might or might not need bone graft. Uh, there's a way of doing this from x-rays, taking the normal x-ray and superimposing the abnormal x-ray and drawing perpendiculars to lines from the dorsal parts of the deformity and normal side to the volar side of the deformity from the abnormal and normal. So drawing a line between the dorsal points and the volar points, and then bisecting those lines and seeing where they, they uh, match up. And in a case like this, uh, and here's the, the original deformity, what happens where these match up, it'll be able to reproduce the normal anatomy without the need of lengthening this. And it may or may not need a great deal of structural bone graft. So this would require an incomplete opening wedge osteotomy. In contrast, if you look at this malposition, this being the abnormal and this being the normal superimposed, it's clear that that intersection of the two perpendiculars extends way beyond the, the bone surface, and this will need to be lengthened. And so you can define this pretty well from x-rays. I realize that many people are moving toward bone modeling and computer generated, but for most malunions, it really can be done preoperative planning without uh, the needed ex uh, unusual expenses. So here's a case where you see such a mal dorsal malunion, 
of a Collies type fracture. And here's the result on the right side of the osteotomy. And this was the technique initially presented by Diego Fernandez in Switzerland. Through a dorsal approach, identifying the extensor pollicis longus, you can take your K wires, place very proximally a K wire perpendicular to the long axis of the radius, and then place a K wire into the malpositioned terminal part of the radius a little bit more than uh, the deformity you want to correct. So if it's a 30 degree extension deformity, perhaps putting it at an angle at 35 degrees will hopefully get you uh, a five degree or so Palmer inclination when the, both of these K wires line up perpendicularly. And here's the result uh, as such. And so this was a rocking osteotomy, did not require lengthening, and therefore really doesn't require a great deal of internal fixation. And that's the patient's uh, functional outcome. When we started with angular stable fixation and locking plates, the question I had to myself was, do I really need a tricortical bone graft taken from the iliac crest? If you've ever experienced that, it never fits perfectly because what you've created is a three-dimensional deformity and it's very hard to interpose a cortical cancellous bone graft that contacts both sides of the osteotomy. So I, here too, I looked at 10 patients in two, in two different groups, 10 patients each. Both had internal fixation with a locking plate. And uh, I compared just cancellous bone versus cortical cancellous bone. Clearly, it's a lot easier to harvest just cancellous bone. In fact, as I'll show, you can do this with um, a bone a substitute. It requires less pain medicine if you're having to go to the iliac crest, and it certainly short, shortens the operative time. Here's an example, and if you look at this frontal plane x-ray, the end of the radius, the malposition, is too wide compared to the shaft, and that tells you there's a rotational malunion, as, long, as well as shortening uh, the osteotomy uh, site. So we have to correct both the extension deformity uh, the distal radiola joint, and the rotational deformity. So using a small uh, uh, spreader, I can put the pins in in the direction I want and then distract this. And if you look at the distractor here at the top and look how far it's been distracted on the bottom image, you get a, an appreciation of the correction that was required. And then the cancellous bone was harvested and uh, through a dorsal plate uh, applied and had a very uh, good functional restoration of the radiocarpal and radio ulna joint. I suspect many of you have, if you've been involved with osteotomy correction, have done this or seen this through a volar approach. This is not new. Actually, Ulrich Lantz in Germany in 1976 described this and uh, um, had his own plate even manufactured. But what we are able to do by approaching volarly with the angular stable fixation is not only correct the sagittal and frontal plane deformities, but also the rotational deformity because you're applying an anatomically shaped plate, a flat plate on the flat surface, using that plate will correct the rotation. By correcting the rotational deformity, we're also improving this relationship between the sigmoid notch and the ulnar head. And that's why ulnar joint problems with this approach have been less um, notable than when we went through the dorsal approach. The other advantage from the volar approach is that you can use your implant 
to help in your reduction uh, by placing the implant offset to the bone in the position that you need to correct uh, the deformity. So here you see an extension deformity with a carpal uh, malalignment. Uh, the hand it clearly has a visible deformity. Once you're approaching from the volar side and have a substantial deformity, the first thing we have to do is um, release the uh, brachioradialis. If you have to get any lengthening at all, the brachioradialis should be released. And then using the implant, we've predicted how much deformity we have to correct in the sagittal plane and in the frontal plane, and then applied the implant in those positions that when we've created the osteotomy, then bringing the implant back to the radial shaft will help correct the deformity. So you really have it under control. Now with osteoporotic patients, this may or may not be a, a, a viable way if you're putting too much stress on the bone, the, the uh, locking screws distally may, may in fact loosen. So they see the implant is offset from the radial shaft and we're creating the osteotomy with the saw, completing it usually with an osteotome the second caveat to realize is that on the dorsal surface, there's still periosteum, which may be adherent, there may be callus, and there may even be deformity from a, a Lister's tubercle that was fractured. So we have to release the dorsal aspect of the uh, malunion as well. So a, a generous release can do that. We recently reported some cases that were done very well but presented at four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks with EPL rupture. And the EPL rupture was from the distorted uh, Lister's tubercle. Uh, so now we've brought the radius uh, uh, shaft part of the plate back to the radial shaft. And if we need lengthening, we can use a push-pull technique against that purple screw to get um, more length. And here we're doing that with a lamina spreader. The lamina spreader should be part of your instrumentation, ideally if you can get that for all your osteotomies, because it not only helps uh, do this and regain some length and to a certain degree alignment, but if you notice the end of the uh, plate is on the malunion of the distal radius, it's you have a radial shift that almost always occurs. And so by once it's in, in place, then by putting the lamina spreader between the ulna shaft and radial shaft before tightening the, the screws in the uh, long arm of the plate, we can correct to a certain degree that radial shift. And here we see the intra-op image and uh, the correction in the frontal and sagittal plane. And now we put in a uh, cancellous bone graft and the fracture is healed. Now look at this patient. Here too, we have shortening and extension deformity. And here too, this is too wide, suggesting a rotational deformity. So we're gonna look at this case from start to finish. Now what I've done is cut out what I wanna correct and I've used tracing paper to do this. My instruments are, are, are simple, but I have that lamina spreader and my choice of implants. I'm going through a standard radio, radio volar approach, freeing up the uh, coronator quadratus in a standard way, but I'd like to be able to have as much exposure all the way across the end of the um, malunion. So by putting in the per perpendicular K-wire to the shaft and then putting in a K-wire in what I think would be the distal mal position. 
My choice of implants in most of these extension osteotomies doesn't have to be a very complex uh, double row plate, but I'm, I'm starting to put in the, the um, angular stable screw fixation distally. Now I have these guides that I've used for years, but one can create their own guides per se. But if you look now, you see that the implant is off the end of the radius in the sagittal plane and off the radius in the frontal plane. And here's my introp imaging, which suggests that I'm in pretty good position on the volar side of, of the uh, end of the radius. At this point, we create the osteotomy. Now, sometimes it's a little technical to do this with the plate in place, but by going across carefully and uh, uh, on either side, making sure you irrigate uh, frequently because uh, if that heats up, it'll burn the end of the bone. And then uh, once we've gone through both on the radial side and on the ulnar side, the cortices, We'll try to complete the osteotomy with an osteotome and mallet. It gives you a little bit uh, better feeling that the saw is not going through the dorsal extensor tendons by doing it this way. So here you see uh, this position of the plate. Now we've created the osteotomy and using the lamina spreader to help bring back the length and then bringing the plate back into the uh, front uh, proximal part of the shaft. And here you see the defect. I'm going to even get a little more length. And so the lamina spreader is spread the radial side uh, more significantly than the ulnar side. And here you see the intraoperative picture. Using the pointed reduction clamp to help uh, guide that proximal shaft. I've been using a bone paste for a number of years uh, as opposed to bone graft uh, in older age patients. We published this in the journal Hand Surgery in 2007. The reason is I can do these as outpatients. There's no morbidity to the iliac crest. And I found with the angular stable fixation, uh, this will provide a little bit of axial loading uh, strength. It won't pr provide shear strain uh, in initially, but it allows me to fill the defect, this three-dimensional defect, effectively. As we see here uh, um, on the defects. So we're mixing the cement uh, and placing it in place. And you can put, the interesting thing with this cement is um, that it will be absorbed when it's in the soft tissue. So it looks like it'll be in the soft tissue, but it's not exothermic like methyl methacrylate, and therefore a less risk of abrasion of the tendons. And within two months to three months, the part in the soft tissues will all be re reabsorbed. Uh, and so we can feel a, a little bit more uh, comfortable in continuously packing this, uh, even though it looks a little bit uh, prominent on the volar surface here. But we found no cases where we lost the fixation or it didn't heal effectively. Oh, let's go on. Oh, let's go back one. So here's the uh, patient at uh, three months. You see the bone uh, cement in place, the realignment in the in all the planes, and the patient did quite well. Well, let's look at intraarticular malunion because it's clear that residual deformity uh, of the articular surface. When it's substantial, will lead to not only 
the kinematic problems of the radio carpal joint, but even post traumatic arthrosis. When to do this and how to plan this effectively. Ideally, the more simple fracture pattern is better, at least to start out with. But understanding the fracture pattern is, is critical. Sometimes we're not sure if seeing the patient at a year or so, whether or not there's residual chondral cartilage damage, and that may not be a good idea. Chronology, in the beginning when we started doing this, we thought, boy, we ideally do this pretty early when seeing the patient. But sometimes you don't have that option. And if there's a real deformity that's going to be a, a major problem, I think it can be done as long as the deformity is clearly understood with imaging. And the soft tissues obviously have to be compliant. Patients have to have good digital motion as well. There's a number of ways that have come about beyond plain x-rays and beyond CT scans using bone modeling for 3D reconstruction. And uh, people who are facile with arthroscopy uh, may find that uh, doing this with the uh, support of an arth arthroscope may be a very effective. The contraindications are clear uh, where there's already degenerative changes, where there's active inflection and inflammation in, in the joint. And uh, really, if there's a complex fracture pattern, uh, it's, it's uh, not a good idea to do this. So ideally, a simple articular, ideally as early as you possibly can, and have a compliant patient as with all these reconstructive procedures. Otherwise, where there's damage, that's extensive uh, arthrodesis of some sort may be required. I mentioned arthroscope uh, approach, and um, uh, that's another uh, way of, of defining the cartilage uh, preoperatively. How to approach these dorsal or volar or arthroscopic depends upon the fracture pattern, obviously. But um, sometimes from a dorsal approach, we can do a more extensile arthrotomy and have direct visualization where that may not be as easily done through a Palmer approach, trying to preserve the radiocarpal volar capsular ligaments. Now here's an intraarticular malunion of the volar lunate facet. And here through a dorsal approach, the articular surface is opened and you see the extensile exposure. Uh, if, if you look closely, there's a little chondral damage on the uh, lunate surface, but that's the volar lunate facet that's being brought back into place and it's really like a, a three or four part fracture and it's fixed uh, as, as you see here. So the sigmoid notch has been restored and the function uh, reasonably uh, effectively restored, particularly the forearm rotation. Now this is a, a young woman I saw. And if you look at the arrows, what you're looking at is the volar lunate facet that's displaced and rotated uh, 180 degrees. So the articular surface uh, that should be looking at the lunate is looking at the uh, radius itself. And it's a little hard to see this, a little blurry picture, but this is done to a, vol a volar ulnar-based approach going through between the flexor tendons on one side, that's protecting the median nerve and the ulnar artery on nerve on the ulnar side, which gives you excellent exposures to the lunate area of the, of the end of the radius. And here we're starting to disimpact this as well. So let's see if we can get this to go. I'm sorry, the quality of this is not great, but I, I want to illustrate it because it's, it's a, it shows you 
where we can identify the specific problem uh, that maybe it's it's possible to do this. So in this case, we can get more extension, uh, more extensive approach by opening the transverse retinacular ligament. That's the carpal canal. And here's our flexor tendons. And we're opening the interval uh, between these flexor tendons and the ulnar artery nerve. And what we're looking at, beginning to look at, is the lunate facet of the end of the radius that's the t- articular surface is facing where that osteotome is. Now, one of the problems that we always worried about and still do is what about the vascularity of this fragment? How will it, it's got no soft tissue uh, attachment, but how do we assure ourselves that this is going to heal? And you probably can't, <coughs> excuse me, be assured, but interestingly enough, that hasn't been the case in in most of these uh, intraarticular osteotomies. So we're looking at the articular surface and trying to bring that back. The other thing about going in and correcting deformities early is there's a certain amount of disuse osteoporosis. So one has to elevate fragments carefully because uh, they can they can uh, fragment uh, uh, quite quickly. So now we're pinning that temporarily in place uh, and hopefully obtain a uh, reasonable realignment and then using a standard volar implant. And here's the implant in place. And these are not great pictures. She came from another part of the country and they were sent to me. So she still has a wide scaphal lunate gap, but the realignment of the volar uh, part of the radius has been accomplished. Now Paco de Pinel in Spain has really put the forefront of uh, arthroscopic assisted. Now here's a case that he he's, uh, was reported in his article in journal hand surgery and He's developed these small instruments that enable under arthroscopic control to be able to open up the, uh, the malunion and uh, bring it back into position and then fix it either with uh, compression screws or K wires per se, or even a plate per se. So this requires a great deal of experience and skill, but it may be a, a way in the future. And lastly, we'll look at combined intra and extra articular deformities where we've got both an articular and, and then a metaphyseal deformity. This is a patient I saw a number of years ago, and I think you can appreciate the shortening, the malrotation of the end of the radius, the lunate facet deformity, the ulnar head deformity, and the extraarticular extension deformity of the metaphysis. Now, these are bone models that were made off of CT scans. And while we're, the move today is toward computer generated, not only uh, understanding the deformity, but giving templates of where to make the, the osteotomy, I think this is even better. Uh, with CAD CAM technology, uh, we can make life-size bone models, and we can actually do the correction on the bone models, comparing it to the opposite side and uh, gaining a better appreciation of what has to be done. And looking at it from the coronal idea, you can see the mal extension and the mal rotation of the end of the radius uh, per se. So intraoperatively, I was able to elevate then the lunate facet and the radial styloid component, and bring that back. I had to take off the ulnar head, which is already uh, compromised. And uh, it, it's a pretty good realignment. I had to take the plates out, uh, which is sometimes the case when um, they become prominent. And we looked at this uh, with uh, 17 patients uh, from three centers. And uh, these patients of variable age, and look at the time from injury, 
was on average about 11 months. So it, it, it shows that it can be done uh, over a, a longer period of time. And here's a case that you can see the extraarticular extension deformity clearly, and the intraarticular deformity of the impacted lunate facet. And then a 3D reconstruction will show you that there's really complete fragments that can be identified and, there, and then judged to how to bring them back in your preoperative planning. So this was the plan, bringing, first elevating the lunate facet and then doing a, a metaphyseal osteotomy. After bringing the lunate facet and the uh, radial si side of the end of the radius together, and then doing that. So here's the lunate facet elevated. Here's the extraarticular osteotomy uh, bone graft placed in there. And uh, you see uh, the lengthening that was required to uh, bring the back the length with a uh, cortical cancellous bone in this case, and two small dorsal plates holding this together. And this is an 11 year follow up with a, a nice functional restoration. Here's another patient with a combined, um, and she came in four months after her, her fracture, and this is what her malunion looked like. She's an active club tennis player, and this is her dominant limb. This was her original fracture. So if you look back, she really healed in the position of her original fracture, taking off the dorsal part of the end of the radius. And here's the malunion. If we're looking at it, <clears throat> from the hand looking toward the uh, radius, what we see is first the radi carpal bones are covered with granulation tissue, but the cartilage is okay. The volar half of the radius is intact, but the dorsal half is what you see here, covered with granulation tissue and impacted. So this will require disimpacting and then an osteotomy created in the metaphyseal section to bring all these pieces together. And here's her function at a year follow-up. Uh, one more case on the volar side with a volar shearing fracture that has healed with a deformity, but it also had a metaphyseal component so that the end of the radius, the volar tilt is um, accentuated. Here's the abnormal side on the left and the normal side on the right. Here's the uh, coronal CT scan showing that volar lip of the lunate facet is displaced uh, and the uh, otherwise um, the articular surfaces are in relatively in good shape. And here's that defect where the volar lunate facet has split off uh, per se. So the goal is to try to bring that back and then do a little bit of an osteotomy to bring the end of the radius into more uh, neutral position. As illustrated in this, uh, this is a case of Dr. Fernandez, illustrated in the schematic. So we want to take out a little bit of bone to bring back that lunate facet and then create the osteotomy in the metaphyseal area and fix everything with a volar plate. This is the volar approach. And um, uh, we're gonna have to open up that fragment and take out that section. So here's that lunate facet fragment being elevated and taking away, clearly you can look into the uh, lunate itself, taking away the sliver of bone to be able to put that back into the more normal position. Uh, a little hard to see here. Here, we're taking that sliver of bone away. There it is, going to be elevated up to put in the metaphyseal defect that will be created. So that's that piece that's going to be removed. That lunate facet is going to be put back and everything fixed with a volar plate. Uh, that's the original implant that was put on to see if it would fit appropriately. And then the osteotomy is 
constructed in the metaphyseal section where the uh, arrow points to. It's a very a little complicated case, but it gives you an idea of understanding preoperatively where the deformity are, uh, deformities are and approaching it uh, sequentially. So that piece is put back into the metaphyseal defect that was created. And here's the um, intraoperative pictures. The piece is being brought back and fixed with the bowler uh, implant, as you see here. The reduction soon after surgery uh, is still a little bit of deformity, and now it's healed reasonably well in the, both in the sagittal plane and the frontal plane, uh, per se. And the function uh, in rotation is excellent, and extension flexion is functional. So this group, interestingly enough, there was really no problems with um, avascular necrosis, uh, but there were some complications of soft tissue problems, uh, moderate changes in one patient of arthritis, but hardware out is sometimes necessary per se. And if you look at the pre and post-op function, uh, it was quite an uh, improvement in all accounts. So I think uh, you understand that um, preoperative planning is uh, really the critical factor in all of these, both uh, extra-articular, intra-articular, and combined deformities. And if we can understand the deformity, we can create uh, osteotomies in a better way. And I'll just finish with this last case just showing uh, intra-articular deformity. That's the uh, position of that was originally fixed. And now using computer-generated uh, modeling, it not only can identify the deformity well, but can identify to a certain degree where to do the osteotomy and uh, how to do it with these... Um, uh, little K wires, and that's what would be the deformity and the fracture fragments, and then uh, how to put on the implant, all done through the computer, and then they'll provide you with a, <clears throat> a jig that will ask you to put the K wires and create the holes that you'll connect with an osteotome or a saw, as illustrated here. So multiple K-wire holes, then creating the osteotomy in that position, and then fixing it with your implant, per se, as seen in the post-op CT scan. So I think this may be a very effective way. It's expensive, and it may be very useful for some of these intra-articular deformities at four weeks post-op and eight weeks uh, so I think I'll stop here, uh, Dr. Mudgall and Dr. Malone, and take any questions and what have you. Thanks, Dr. Jupiter. That was uh, a tour de force, Dr. Jupiter. And uh, <clears throat> you know, every time I think about situations and sessions like this, and I listen to experts like you, it makes me realize why even North America's Hand Education Committee is undeniably the leader in the hand surgery education across the world. So thank you, that was fantastic. Uh, okay. Kevin, questions for you? Yep, so a couple of questions have popped up from our participants and, and before I get to them, I wanna to just touch on something that you mentioned early on with the EPL uh, and, and ruptures of the EPL down the road. Uh, do you routinely transpose or decompress the EPL with your osteotomies? If doing through a volar approach, do you make a dorsal incision to, you know, re release and uh, tra uh, transpose or, or move the EPL into a subcutaneous position? Uh, not, not generally, uh, but that's that's an important point is by going over onto the dorsal side and then identifying whether or not there's an osteophyte uh, from the Lister tubercle or the edge of your osteotomy, yeah. once you've reduced it, is, is um, a little prominent, then definitely move the EPL. 
but otherwise, um, not necessarily. Okay. So, uh, yeah, but, uh, yeah. as a segue to your question, I wonder what Jesse might think about this. You know, NITO and colleagues had looked at CT orientation of uh, fracture patterns of the distal radius, and if they found that the fracture pattern extended to the Lister's tubercle or the bed of the EPL, they made it a point to expose it and decompress an acute fracture fixation. Do you think that if we had a CT that showed us that pattern as we are planning our osteotomy, we should be releasing the EPL just as Kevin said? Uh, it's certainly not <clears throat> not unreasonable. Uh, um, but I have to say, um, uh, I, I've had experience with quite a lot of osteotomies through bowler approach, and I, I only had one case that that caused a, a rupture. Now that rupture is different. It's an a it's a rupture. Uh, by abrasion of the tendon going over a sharp surface. Sure. The traditional rupture, maybe what you're talking about, uh, comes about where uh, there's ischemia to the, sure. to the EPL from right. uh, avascular changes where the compartment hasn't been opened up. So I think better part of valor is always to, to do, do it if there's any concern. Right. right. Thank you. So uh, some of the questions from our participants. Uh, first one was, uh, do you have any pearls to help realign the distal radial ulnar joint? Uh, and how important is it to restore the sigmoid notch? Uh, the the uh, stability of the distal radial ulnar joint comes ideally from the contact pressure of the ulnar head to the sigmoid notch. Okay. So when you're in the OR and you fix the fracture, uh, the way to test if you have stability or not is not by belotting the end of the ulnar up and down, because it'll often be loose because the ligaments have stretched or even torn, but compress the ulnar head into the sigmoid notch and then rotate the forearm. And very rarely will you feel instability. And that's why in all the large series of volar plate fixation of distal radius fractures. And I'm not talking about necessary osteotomies per se. Uh, there's not much instability noted, and that's because the orientation of the sigmoid notch has been restored. So how did you do it with an osteotomy? Well, that, that's planning to get that um, uh, lunate facet um, into position. And sometimes it's a little hard from the volar approach if the deformity is from the dorsal lunate facet. So you may need a, a second incision per se, but that's a very good point because that's that's where the stability will come from, uh, that relationship. Okay. In your slideshow, you showed a couple of cases where you really reestablished the length of the radius uh, by you know a full volar defect uh, that you then grafted, you know, how, how much do you try to increase the length of the radius as opposed to going over to the ulna and shortening the ulna? Uh, well, that, that, uh, you can have trouble if it's more than 10 millimeters getting your length, uh, um, per se, but, um, it's not common to have to go over to the ulna side. That, that's a really, really bad malunion, and that's a good idea to do. The important thing, if you're shortening the ulna, in any case, if you have ulnar impaction or something as a result in association with a malunion, you have to be careful of the orientation of the sigmoid notch, because if the rotation hasn't been restored at the end of the radius, your sigmoid notch may not be in the normal orientation, which is slightly oblique, pointing from proximal to distal in an ulnar direction. Mm -hmm. If it's still pointing toward a radial direction, your ulnar head may not seat very well in the sigmoid notch. So that's another thing to look at in those cases. Right, and uh, one other really good question that came up was, and the patient that has a malunion and then an associated carpal instability pattern, and you suspect a ligamentous issue, would you, do a concomitant ligament reconstruction or repair at the same time, or do you stage those? Uh, no, no, do it at the same time. Uh, um, one thing about 
scaphalunate instability or, or let's say scaphalunate gaps associated with distal radius fractures, it's rarely a true li total ligament injury. It's more the dorsal supporting structures that have stretched per se. But I would think if there's any concern, do the osteotomy and, and do an arthroscope and then confirm whether or not there's a complete d displacement. But now I would do it at the same time. Great. So, Thanks, you know, I think that is a wonderful set of questions. And it just makes me wonder uh, about, you know, you talked about uh, uh, radial sided procedures, obviously, for radial malunion. Do you, as the surgeon, make it a point to consent patients for ulnar sided procedures at the same time? And is it important for our learners to know that? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, per se. However, um, the better part of valor may not be to try to do too much at the same time. Now, if, if, if I'm having a difficult time with my osteotomy, it's far better to let things complete the osteotomy, heal, and at some early point, shorten the ulna. But don't try to do too much, per se. When I answered Kevin's question about would I do the ligament at the same time, mm -hmm. that's a little different because um, you're, you're right there, per se. I'm not having to do another exposure, True. Uh, per se, unless I went from the volar side. If I went from the volar side, then I might not do the scaphalunate at the same time as well because right. adding too much surgery. If, if you were to, uh, let's say, for lack of a better term, struggle to gain length, how critical is it for you to release the carpal tunnel at the same time? Well, that's the advantage of the volar side. Yes. I think um, it's, uh, it's always, uh, to me at least, beneficial to re release the carpal tunnel, per se. You don't burn any bridges by doing it. So would you say it's part and parcel of your routine? If you're trying to get length, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you've pointed that out quite a number of times. But, um, you know, there are a lot of things said about patients with so-called dystrophy and distal radius fractures and whatever. For the most part, most true complex regional pains are related to the median nerve. Yes, Yes. And, and therefore have a high degree of uh, suspicion uh, that you lengthened uh, that to avoid problems to release the carpal canal. So, you know, the thing, uh, when I listened to your uh, talk, I, I wondered about asking you, I see that you've noticed, I mean, I see that you uh, lengthened the radius in uh, some cases where you don't have volar cortical contact, nor do you have dorsal cortical contact. Does that bother you? And do you think that makes a difference to union and outcomes? Well, it, it, it did bother me as I uh, related in terms of bone graft. In the, in the past, before we had angular stable fixation, mm -hmm. that's where we went to the cortical cancellous graft. Right. And, uh, and pretty good double plate fixation. Uh, with the angular stable fixation, not as much at all. Um, I think that the, um, the uh, bone graft uh, can be just cancellous bone or, or bone substitute per se. Now, it, once you start getting too much, uh, you can't. You can't get, as I say, more than 10 millimeters. Yeah. Uh, I think you can't get the tissue stretched that much. Yeah. No, the, Jupiter, one, one final question from one of your colleagues in Seattle. Um, have you ever had a case where your volar fixation wasn't stout enough because of poor bone quality? And, and if yes, what do you do in those cases? Uh, I've used um, a radial base plate and a volar plate. Hmm. So two implants. And would, if you were... Uh, would you be more inclined to use structural graft in that situation too? Uh, 
and perhaps, but um, not not really. No, no, be, because the structural graft uh, sometimes gives you a false sense of security. But often you're 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 just um, just the volar surface or the cortical surfaces you hope to have good contact, but you don't always have good contact throughout the whole three-dimensional right. aspect of the osteotomy. Right. I prefer a second plate. Yeah. I mean, you could go to a lot of things. I mean, you can, if you're not sure, an external fixator or even a bridge plate, you know, uh, something to, to take off the stress if, you, if you're really un, uncomfortable with your fixation. So that's a perfect segue into my next question. You know that on our service, we had looked at uh, dis acute distal radius fractures, which were fixed with volar angular stable fixation. And we compared acute range of motion versus six weeks later delayed range of motion. And we found that at six months, the motion was just the same. So let's presume you are one of these people who are watching this webinar from a resource poor environment. You don't have these fancy plates. Are you... Would you think that their outcomes with K-wires, bone graft, and casting are going to be reasonably similar to ours? Yeah, the, the, you know, the, the idea that uh, volar plating of distal radius fractures will allow more rapid motion and ergo a better outcome. In all of the literature of treating distal radius fracture, whether they're casted, external fixator, pins and plaster, K-wires, whatever, what you start to see is at between three and six months, the motion all becomes the same. Right, right. And um, so the idea of, of moving the patient right away or, or at three weeks or six weeks probably doesn't make... A, a huge bit of difference uh, if it's at the expense of patient discomfort, whatever. But all the studies, if you look at they all become pretty close in terms of motion by six months and certainly um, by a year. Now, it doesn't mean they'll be normal, but they'll, they'll, whatever you do will, will work out about the same. That is so awesome to hear. So for people who are watching this webinar from resource poor environments, you have heard from the main man himself. It is okay as long as you get stable fixation and good radiographic correction. You don't have to go crazy about trying to move these patients early. You can cast them for a few weeks and then start rehabbing them. So um, um, can I have, uh, let me start sharing my screen and maybe have time for a couple cases. What do you think, Dr. J? Okay. So the reason I brought this case up is because it's somewhat unusual, and I learned this from you, and I think it's really important to emphasize to our audience. So here's this 28-year-old female desk worker who was treated non-operatively. And when you see something like this, um, without giving too much away, would that bother you if you saw it and she came to you for ongoing symptoms? Well, if she has symptoms, yes. <laughs> If she doesn't have symptoms, maybe less so. But if you yeah. if you take if you take the radiocarpal, the capitolunate longitudinal axis, it's it ends up be almost below the radius shaft. So there's a volar displacement. Those patients may have problems in rotation. Ah, look at that. That's why he's the master. So here's a wrist range of motion. But look at her supination. Right. So this is, so um, do you think they lose supination as a, uh, I mean, it, is, is that the main motion that is lost in these patients? Yes. Yes. It's, it's a, because it's not just a bowler, it's, it's a little bit of a malrotation. Right. Yeah. Now, when you see someone like this, for you, are you content with just imaging them with plain radiographs? Or do you want to have more sophisticated imaging? Well, it depends um, how long she is after her injury. Um, yeah, this is about six months or seven months. Okay, well then, then yes, then you need you need a CT scan at least. Mm. 
So here we go. And now when you see something like this, your strategy for assessing them and advising them is dorsal approach, volar approach. How, how do you counsel these patients? Well, for the most part, the, the problem is, is the volar displacement. So it's more, more readily approached on the volar side. Okay. And if you were to osteotomize them, what is in, in the proximal distal plane? Where do you locate your osteotomy? Yeah, ideally, where the fracture is, was. Right. Now, it's hard to say on these, but uh, how does the role of the DRUJ location play into your osteotomy, uh, you know, making it? Are you just proximal to the DRUJ? Uh, yeah. Yes. So here we are. That's exactly what we did. And I, I, I took a leaf out of your book and I used Noria. Yeah. And when you do this, are you comfortable letting, this, letting these people move early? Uh, she's young. She's got good bone. I've used Norian, but how soon does Norian have mechanical strength for you to let them move? Well, it, does, it doesn't have, as I say, shear or rotational strength. It has axial strength by 12 hours after you put it in, uh, and then by 24 hours for sure. But um, that's not going to really make the difference. I think doing an osteotomy is different than a fracture, too. Mm. Um, I don't see any reason to have a patient mobilize <laughs> so soon. Uh, I would, when you change the dressing uh, at two weeks, maybe a volar splint and they can come out as for comfort, but I wouldn't be aggressive with therapy at that point. Now, if, if the patient were to say to you, Hey, Dr. J, you know, I can still see my osteotomy site. It's one year. Uh, how do you pacify them about how long does it take for the Norian to uh, reossify? Well, uh, from all of the, experimental work that was done um, and from my own experience using it uh, uh, quite a bit it it doesn't in you know it the theory is that it it it's it's taken by the host as normal bone mm -hmm. and so you get normal bone turnover mm -hmm. but it, it doesn't happen very quickly so if no. I see a fracture line at a year, from an osteotomy, I, I get a little concerned. Yeah. If this patient were a smoker, would you feel inclined to add a radial column plate in addition? No, she's 20 something years old. That's good. Right, but she, she could be a smoker. Uh, no, to be honest, you put me on a limb here, but I, I don't believe so much in that. Okay. If Fair they, enough. They have good. It, it, Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to pick your brain. I know, I know. <laughs> I mean, the normal answer is yes, be concerned, but I, I, not at this age. So this is exactly what I learned from you, and that's exactly what we did. And she went on to have a reasonable outcome. She has recovered a supination. Yeah, yeah. Good. So um, we have time for one more case, and let me see. So here's someone. He's a 65-year-old male researcher. Uh, he was seen in the ED on day one, and he was told he had a minor fracture and sent home with a splint. Well, that's a that's a looks like a shearing fracture of the volar surface. Yeah, uh, and you see the in the frontal plane that that dark line that's a lunate facet shear fracture. Yeah, not a common. So not not surprisingly, he came to me at about eight or nine weeks and he had a painful wrist and there he is. Now, when you're faced with this, how can you walk us through your uh, thought process? What goes through the Jupiter head before you decide to take this person to the OR? Well, um, you know, it, it depends on, on 
on their activity level and their, and their disability, but he's very active. I think you need imaging uh, to define it more clearly. Um, and so th that's something that should be amenable to uh, uh, reducing it and fixing it either with a variety of ways to do that. Uh, the group at Duke published a, a series of 13 patients where they uh, did osteotomies of the bola lunate facet. Uh, so I think that's a fairly sizable piece of bone. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, I think either a small plate or hook plate or even uh, threaded headless screws. So your traditional approach for this, would it be something like this? Yes, that's the bowler ulnar side. Uh, and as I uh, tried to show, you go between the ulnar artery and nerve and the yes. flexor tendons. Yeah. Releasing the transverse ligament will help you get even more exposure. Yeah. And um, I just wouldn't make such a dark line. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are, and you can see that uh, the fracture plane is right about there. And uh, I've elevated, I find the fracture easy to identify at its proximal extent. Now, once you reach this point, uh, do you think a simple screw or a K-wire is adequate or in, a, in an eight and nine year old, uh, nine week old fix, uh, fracture that you need to have a plate? Uh, I think if you elevate and you have a defect below, uh, you should put something below that and then a plate is better. Yeah. So that's exactly what we did. We used a cannulated headed screw with a washer and, uh, and we restored it. Now his lunates lined up with the radius and... Yeah, so. it's perfect, yeah. So there he is. I think um, in the interest of time, we should be uh, stopping there. Okay. Uh, any more questions from? Uh, no, we've uh, there are a couple more that we answered, but uh, I think we we hit all okay. the high points. Okay, so Wait. let me just uh, run through something else here. And uh, Dr. Jupiter, thank you. Oh, you're very you welcome. Dr. Hitter. Nice to see you. Batchman, and you've done a fantastic job as usual. And we are immensely grateful for, uh, for allowing us to pick your brain. For the audience across the world, uh, these are the sessions coming up in the future. We have Chuck Cassidy uh, on October 21st, uh, Tom Fisher, followed by Jinbo Tang talking about flexor tendons in zone two, Amit Gupta talking about scaphoid fractures and non unions. And finally, we are rounding out the year with uh, Jesse's old buddy uh, mm -hmm. and my other mentor, Hill Hastings, who's going to talk to us about Hemi Hammett. Now, uh, to receive CMA credits, a link will be sent to you <coughs> after the conclusion of the entire series. And that's when you will get your CMA credits. A link to the recording will be sent to you 24 hours after the conclusion of this webinar. And it will be accessible to most of us um, on the YouTube channel of Air North America uh, hand. If uh, there are no more questions or no more comments, I would just say thank you to Dr. Jupiter and uh, Dr. Malone for uh, doing a fantastic job, to the AO North America staff for making this seem so seamless and easy. And I'm grateful to all of you who attended. Thank you and good night. Good night. Thank you all. Great job. Be good, Max. We're great. Thanks so much. Have a good night.